Ladies and gentlemen, before I go on, I'd like to introduce my wife, who's with me today, Annie. Would you like to stand up? <laughs> and my sister, Bianti, and her husband, Sudraja Jiwandono. <laughs> Some of you may know that um, I was here five and a half years ago, July 2013, doing the exact same thing. And it struck me as I got into this room how beautiful this room is. And apparently, uh, this room was renovated at great cost after my speech. <laughs> so that's why I didn't recognize it. So thank you, Ambassador Blake, Ambassador Merrill, for inviting me to this August occasion in this grand venue. So um, I don't regret coming here today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as David said, I've been asked to give a talk about how Prabhu Sandi, the, our, our duo, vying for the presidency of Indonesia, how they view Indonesia's problems. What he didn't say was that, that he gave me, he's given me only 30 minutes to say it. So I'm, I'll endeavor to compress everything into 30 minutes, a talk which I usually give for an hour and 30 minutes usually followed by a, a question and answer period of one hour. So I'll try to do it in many of the many problems uh, that Indonesia faces as we see it. I'm sure Mr. Lutfi, who is representing our opponent, he'll have a different view of Indonesia's problems, and of course, he's entitled to them. So the problems as we see it, and I've listed six problems for some of you who want to, to write them down, six major problem areas, and then several other areas, actually, of some of them of equal importance. So the first problem that Prabhu has seen, and he's seen this for many, many years. This is not a new uh, issue. Uh, you know, when, when I looked at our program of 2009, Prabhu, my brother, was the vice presidential candidate for Megawati Sukarnoputri, the former president of Indonesia. She is now our opponent, supporting Joko Widodo from the same party. When, we, when I look at the program that we had in 2009, and this is the Gurinder's program, and then I looked at the program that we put forth in 2014, I, I must say I'm, I was quite impressed. I've been impressed by how consistent Prabowo has been in the last 10 years. And I think this shows something, and this, this is one of the reasons why I support my brother, not only because he's my brother, but I think he's the right person to solve Indonesia's problems at this time. Maybe not in 10 years' time, maybe not in 20 years' time, but certainly at this time, in my opinion. So ladies and gentlemen, the problem areas that we see is firstly public health, national public health, which has been a concern for Prabowo for the last 10, 11, 12 years. We're talking about stunting growth, and I assume most of you or all of you know what stunting growth means. It means subnormal or abnormal uh, development for children under the age of five, usually uh, even during the, you know, in the fetal stage, often during the pregnancy of the mother. Now, when Prabhu ran for vice president in 2009, 30% of Indonesia's uh, children under the age of five suffered from stunting growth. According to the World Bank a few months ago to me, this year, I'm sorry, last year in 2018, the figure has gone up from 30% to 38% of all Indonesian children under the age of five suffer from stunting growth, which means that will not only will children be dwarfish, have dwarfish tendencies, uh, lower than, than the normally shorter Indonesians are anyway, but also with stunted brain development. So in my opinion, my, bro my brother's opinion, in Sandi Uno's opinion, this can lead and is leading to a huge national catastrophe, a calamity, if you will. If in the next few generations, the prospect is that 38% of Indonesian, the Indonesian population will be afflicted by stunting growth. So in effect, only 62% of Indonesia's population in the future will actually be able to develop normally as other normal human beings. Now, many other countries also off, uh, suffer from stunting growth, but according to the World Bank, the numbers are much, much less 
Indonesia is almost one of the highest rates of stunting growth in the world, 38%. Now, besides that, I'm trying to compress now to, to, to 30 minutes. We have also one of the highest mortality rates of mothers giving birth. I think the figure was, and thank you, Linda Linsmeyer, for telling me this, 33%. I think that's the number that Linda found out for me, 33%. Um, we also have a national health insurance system which is basically bankrupt. Hospitals haven't been paid for five months. Doctors have not been paid their salaries for five months. Pharmacies have not been reimbursed for one year and more. The national health insurance system in Indonesia, we say BPJS. I see some in Indonesians in this room. BPJS is essentially bankrupt. 16 trillion rupees in arrears. That's $1.2 billion in arrears that uh, the government owes to BPGS. The second problem area is national education. Some of you already know that Indonesia consistently rates, ranks last in the major educational uh, surveys. Um, in, the, in, the PISA, sorry, in the Pearson study, which is out of the UK, um, I've studied this for 10 years, and in the last 10 years, every year, Indonesia consistently ranks the worst. We ranked number 40 out of 40 major countries, according to the Pearson study. According to the PISA study, P-I-S-A, which is sponsored by the OECD, and I think all of you know what the OECD means and what it stands for and what it consists of, Indonesia does not rank worst, but we are pretty close. We're number 65 out of 73 countries rated. So we're pretty, we're, we're pretty down there. Singapore is number one, which is no surprise. But what was shocking to me was not that we were number 65, was that Vietnam is rated number eight in the world. Vietnam is ranked eighth in the world, Indonesia 65 out of 73. Now, I think all of you know that Vietnam's per capita income is still much lower than Indonesia. Vietnam is a poorer country than Indonesia. But somehow they have got their education system right and somehow Indonesia has still got it wrong. And what is even worse than that is that according to the World Bank, Rodrigo Chavez, who's become a friend of mine, I think Ambassador Blake, you know him, he's the chief rep of the IBRD, the World Bank in Indonesia, he told me, and his staff told me, that Vietnamese village children, school children from Vietnamese villages consistently outperform Indonesian students, Indonesian kids in the capital city of Jakarta. That, for me, was truly, truly shocking. I reported this to my brother. This just reinforces our program. We have to overhaul, we have to reform, and we have to revitalize our education system. So when you mix our national health problems, I would consider it a crisis, together with our educational problem, and some would say an educational crisis. I'm sure my, my, my sister, Bianti, who's an educationist, uh, she's from the Harvard School of Education. I think she would say it's a national education crisis when we have such a poor education system. So we have a poor health system coupled with a poor education system. The recipe is for a disaster. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, and you're welcome to ask Mr. Lutfi next week about his views, but I haven't seen anything from our opponents that say they're going to address these issues. They basically have a different set of priorities. There's this infrastructure, which we also think very, very important. But it seems to me that the national leadership, the president and vice president, has to pay attention to not only infrastructure, highways, roads, airports, bridges, uh, ports. These are very important. But we also have to address health, education, and others. Now, the third problem area that we see is that we are now in the midst of an energy crisis. Now, here, to be fair to the government, to our opponents, the National Energy Council admitted three months ago in public that Indonesia is in the middle of an energy crisis. Now, this may seem bizarre to you, because you know, most of you know Indonesia is an oil-producing uh, country, well, I can tell you that in five years' time, 
our, our total oil reserves will be completely depleted in five years' time. Indonesia actually imports a million barrels a day of mostly product. As our friends from Chevron can attest to, Indonesia imports a million barrels of oil products and oil, crude oil a day. And that is, that is projected to increase exponentially over the next few years. Our entire nat nat natural gas reserve will be depleted in 20 years. These are numbers which have been confirmed by the energy minister, Mr. Yonan, who, by, by the way, is a, is a friend of, a long-standing friend of mine. He's confirmed to me all these numbers. Five years' time, oil will be gone. 20 years' time, gas will be gone. And what is even more frightening is that, and he has confirmed this, Yonan has confirmed this to me, at the most 40 years' time, Indonesia's com commercially viable coal reserves will be completely depleted. So we will have no gas, no oil, and no commercially viable coal within 40 years. Now this is the difference between my brother and his opponent. My brother looks at Indonesia 50 years from now. He looks at Indonesia 100 years from now. He doesn't look at the next election. He doesn't look at the next election cycle. We are talking about all these things that matter to our children, grandchildren, our great great grandchildren. We have a long-term horizon, and we think a country like Indonesia needs a long-term horizon. We have to look to the long term. We have to look at 50, 100 years from now, because if nothing is done, and the danger is nothing is going to be done about national health, about children's um, welfare, their health, 38% of Indonesia's population will consist of abnormally unhealthy individuals. 38%. That is the prospect. With a schooled, educated, in a universally regarded, uh, an education system regarded as very, very poor. The fourth problem area, and in some cases, some people would say that probably the most problematic is socio-economic inequality. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the Americans in this room, you talk about the 1%, the 99%. Uh, I'm fortunate, Ani and I are fortunate to be one of the 1% if we were to live in America. Unfortunately, in Indonesia, uh, the socio-economic inequality is, has become so, so um, uh, severe that we've been rated by the World Bank. The IBRD says that we are one of the three worst countries in terms of social inequality in the world. Out of 193 countries in the United Nations, this is according to Rodrigo Chavez and the World Bank team, Indonesia is the, one of the three worst countries in terms of inequality. You may know that the worst is Mozambique. The second worst in the world is Russia. Russia is the second worst country in the world in terms of economic inequality. A very few oligarchs, uh, members of the Russian elite, own a vast portion, a vast sector of the Russian economy. Indonesia is not far behind. In fact, we rate very, very bad as well. In fact, the top four families in Indonesia, the top four richest businessmen, richest persons in Indonesia, own more wealth and have more income than 100 million Indonesians. And that is according to Oxfam, has been confirmed by the Indonesian government. In, in our opinion, this is a recipe for disaster. In the opinion of my brother and of ourselves. And by the way, we don't hide the fact that we are both quite prosperous and well-off people. But we do believe that it's our duty, it's our duty as leaders among the top uh, Social class in Indonesia, it's our duty to help Indonesia get out of our problems. We believe it's our patriotic duty. It might sound corny to you, but we are patriotic. We believe it's our patriotic duty to be able to right these matters. Now, the fifth problem area that Prabowo feels very important is the environment. I talked to some of the members of the audience earlier about the fact that According to the Ministry of Environment and the Forestry, 88 million hectares of Indonesian forests is degraded, is considered degraded. 24 million hectares is extremely degraded. 
And the many reasons for this, illegal logging is one of them, mass forest fires, and the like. But I'd like to point out to you that the entire budget of the Indonesian Ministry of Forestry allocated to the protection of forests is one-third the entire budget of the World Wildlife Fund in Indonesia. In other words, the World Wildlife Fund's office in Indonesia's budget is three times the budget of the Indonesian Ministry of Forestry for the forest rangers, for wildlife protection, for forest protection. It's one-third with the World Wildlife Fund's budget for Indonesia. To me, that's scandalous. A Prabowo administration would add multiples of that in its first year. Multiples and multiples and multiples of that to protect our forests, to protect our wildlife, to protect our rural populations. That, that's a pledge to you, by the way. Very important for me, very important for Prabowo. The environment, as some of you may know, that Indonesia now is considered the second biggest polluter of maritime garbage. I don't know whether you know that. After China. China is the biggest polluter of maritime marine garbage. We are number two. And the marine pollution caused by this garbage is, has actually become a health hazard for human beings. There was a, in the press a few months ago a case of a whale which uh, had beached itself in the, one of the beaches in uh, Flores, I think. And they did an autopsy. They opened the belly of the whale and they found that the bowels of the, of the whale was full of plastic. Full of plastic. In fact, they weighed it. I think there were seven tons of plastic in the whale's belly. Now, you multiply this by other fish, by turtles, by other marine life, by birds, seagulls. It's affecting the, the welfare of fishermen. It's decreasing their uh, incomes. Tens of millions of Indonesians rely on the sea for their livelihood. And now we have a problem. It's called microplastics. I, I, I think some of you know that. Microplastics is now being found in the food chain, which human beings are actually uh, consuming. So it's big, a big problem in Indonesia. That is a priority of Pro President Prabowo and Vice President uh, Sandi Uno. That's a, a top priority for, for them. Microplastics, a human health hazard, a major problem. To be fair, the current government has suddenly found that that to be a major problem. I mean, they're four and a half years late, in our opinion. But okay, never too late. We would do a much better job, in, our, in my opinion. Um, and lastly, I'm sorry, on, on wildlife, uh, the destruction of the environment and the forests have led to widespread destruction of, of wildlife, of orangutans, of rhinos, of elephants, of bears. It's a, it's a topic dear to my heart. Prabowo has adopted that. We are going to put a lot of emphasis, a lot of energy, a lot of uh, funding for wildlife protection, which we think is so much so important for, for the heritage of, of our country. Now, lastly, the sixth biggest uh, uh, item for us would be combating corruption. Uh, Ambassador Blake and I just talked about that. We have already put it on the record that we would be adding multiples and multiples of the current budget to reinforce the anti-corruption agency, KPK. By the way, I told Mr. Blake uh, that four years ago, uh, my party, the Grinder Party, was the only party out of the 10 in parliament which refused to accept the government's plan to weaken the KPK. They were going to change the KPK law to weaken the KPK. We actually was uh, the only party in parliament which refused to accept my, my son, who's a member of parliament, I was very proud that he was chosen to be a spokesman for our party. He was the one who read our party's uh, uh, refusal, our party's stance on the KPK. And, by the way, the former vice chairman of the KPK, who was fired by the Jokowi government, by the way, his name is Mr. Bambang Wijayanto. He's a very prominent anti-corruption activist. He has joined the Prabowo Sandi camp. He's become an advisor to Prabowo 
on anti-corruption, and he is part, has, he's one of the persons who wrote our platform. He's a major, major addition to, the, 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 to, our, to our platform and to our ticket. The reason why he joined us, because he's not convinced. He's not convinced that this current government is wholeheartedly committed to fighting corruption. He has told us that he doesn't believe in this current government's uh, intentions, and he believes that we can do a better job. Now, there are other issues. Uh, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. We have other issues. There's defense and foreign affairs, the South China Sea, Ambassador Blake, that's an issue. We have another issue of foreign illegal workers. And the United States is not the only problem, not, not the only country in the world with, with a problem with, with illegal aliens. We have also have a, a, a same problem. Um, and then another issue is that the so-called demographic bonus, and some of you may, you may know what it is, is when a country has actually got a growing young population. That's been considered an asset for Indonesia as well as India. Well, the problem is, according to the World Bank again, that our demographic bonus ends in 11 years. So, our, in 2030, the Indonesian population starts to age. We will have an aging population starting in 11 years. Now, according to the World Bank, no country in human history has escaped poverty when their population is in decline. I'll repeat that. According to the World Bank, no country in the world has escaped poverty when they're experiencing a population in decline, an aging population. What does it mean? It means that Indonesia has only 11 years left. We have 11 years left with a depleting energy base, with a national health crisis, with an environmental crisis. You can see why I'm in politics. <laughs> you can see why I'm in politics. We've got to do something about it. And doing something means you have to be aware of it. Now, the, the, our, our opponents are always saying, oh, Prabowo and Sandy, you're, you're spreading um, pessimism. You're pessimistic. Pessimism. You should, you, know, you should spread optimism. Well, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, how can you be optimistic with all these statistics, which are not you know, figments of the imagination of Prabowo and Sandy? These are, these are data, these are statistics from respectable institutions like the World Bank. So these are the things that uh, I just want to say. Um, infrastructure, I said earlier, is very important, but it's only one facet, it's only one aspect of the problems of a developing country like Indonesia. We have the other six problems that we have to, um, to correct. Now, what are the solutions? The other side always asks, what are the solutions? Well, we have quite simple solutions. One is that we will be increasing the tax ratio of Indonesia. Now, some of you may not know what it means because I know Indonesians often ask, they get mixed up between the tax rate and the tax ratio. Now, the tax rate is the rate of income tax or corporate income tax, which is levied on Indonesians and corporations, individuals and corporations. In Indonesia, it's 25% for corporations and 30% for individuals. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the tax ratio. The tax ratio is the ratio between tax revenues of a given country and the GDP of any given country. Now, Indonesia's tax ratio is scandalously low. In fact, the only country, there's only one country with a worse tax ratio than Indonesia, and that is Pakistan. Pakistan's tax ratio is 8%, according to the World Bank. Indonesia's is barely above 8%. It's between 9.5 and 9.8%. That is according to the old methodology. Now, the Indonesian government, in all its wisdom, has changed the methodology, and now they claim the tax ratio has gone up to 11.5%. Well, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that's hogwash. Using the methodology which was used until a few months ago, the Indonesian tax ratio is actually below 10%. Now, why do I mention this? Well, some of you may or may not know that we have a neighboring country called Thailand, 
with many of the same conditions that we do, their tax ratio is 19%. India has a tax ratio of 20%. Now, when you take these numbers and juxtapose to, to the GDP of Indonesia, and according to most experts, it's $1 trillion. We have a GDP of $1 trillion. We're talking about an opportunity cost. We're talking about lost revenues of between 90 to $100 billion a year. This is the revenues that the Indonesian government should be making. They should be collecting 90 to $100 billion every year. And yet they're not. There's a country in Africa called Zambia. They get collecting 16%. The tax ratio of Zambia is 16% of GDP. So my brother, when I told my brother about this statistic, he joked half seriously. He said, then when I become president, I'm going to ask technical assistance from the president of Zambia, and we'll go up to 16% very, very soon. Half seriously, because he's thinking about that. So we may go come closer, ask the ties for technical assistance, and maybe the government of India, and we'll get 20%. So ladies and gentlemen, when we're talking about adding to the budget of the forest rangers and wildlife protection and the Ministry of Forestry, we're talking about raising the tax ratio. And when my brother becomes president, the tax ratio will go up to 19, 20%. It shouldn't be very difficult, according to Rodrigo. Uh, the World Bank says it should not be difficult. It should not be difficult. When we come to the Q&A, you can ask me why. It shouldn't be too difficult. I'll give you an answer. But we should be able to get another 90 billion to 100 billion US dollars per year of a Prabowo presidency. And we can then fix the problems. The deficit of our national health insurance system is $1.2 billion. $1.2 billion. We can solve that problem within two weeks of additional incremental tax revenue. Within two weeks, we can solve that deficit. We shouldn't be, have to keep our doctors waiting five months uh, for their salaries and pharmacies a year and year and more to be re reimbursed. They can quickly go bankrupt as, as a business. The second solution, the second solution is what Prabowo calls the big push. The big push is meant to solve, largely solve our energy problem, is meant to solve our food problem, is meant to solve our environmental problem. And I mentioned this to, earlier to Ambassador Blake. What Prabowo and Sandy and I want to do, and our team wants to do, is to do mass reforestation of Indonesia's degraded forest. We have 88 million hectares of degraded forest. It's increasing. The degraded forests are increasing in size by, according to the government, 700,000 hectares a year. That's a minimum, in my opinion. We're talking about 1.7 million acres a year of degradation, degraded forest. This has to stop. Otherwise, within 20 years, we won't have any forest cover left. And at this rate, all our national parks and our national forests and all protected forests and all our wildlife will become extinct and disappear. We'll have to change. And the book, Big Push is a concept that we've tested. This concept was proposed to President SBOI 10 years ago. For some reasons, he never got it done. I actually talked to President Jokowi when he was governor uh, of Jakarta. He didn't, he didn't understand what the concept was. Um, and so Prabowo is, and Sandy have undertaken to put, to put this methodology. We want to reforest Indonesia. We want to be able to produce food crops. We want to produce energy. We want to produce various other uh, energy source from, from waste wood. This, in our opinion, will be able to solve many of the problems and create about 27 and a half million jobs. I don't have time in the 20 minutes allotted to explain, but uh, please ask me about it during the Q&A. I'll take my time to explain it. But we have a solution which we presented at COP21 in Paris. I was part of the Indonesian delegation. I was part of the official delegation asked by the Minister of Forestry. I presented our model. She asked me to represent our model, our program. Very well received. Several governments of, uh, in, in, um, in Africa 
uh, the government of, of Madagascar, the former government of Madagascar, he, was, he lost the election last month, um, the president of Madagascar, the former president of Madagascar. He actually asked me to come to Madagascar to do this project in Madagascar. The, the former government of Tanzania has invited us, invited me to, to do this project in Tanzania. Uh, the government of Cameroon is interested, uh, the government of, of, um, of Nigeria, and the government of Ghana, and the government of, um, of Senegal are also interested to do this mass reforestation. Because this reforestation project does not include or does not need philanthropy. It's not for handouts or giveaways. It's actually a money-making operation, being able to create a lot of jobs in Indonesia. The second, uh, the third solution is to address corruption. People ask us, Prabowo, what are you going to do about corruption? Corruption is so endemic, it's so pervasive. In fact, Secretary Pompeo, whom I met this morning, mentioned corruption in developing countries. Corruption, and the effect of corruption on elections, he mentioned that as well. Um, what we are going to do is actually quite simple. It's going to appeal to the better nature of most human beings. It's basically, if you address their material wants, Provide them, them a decent salary uh, with which, on which to work and to retire. And I choose my words not lightly. The problem is that most Indonesian civil servants, including high court judges, police generals, general prosecutors, look forward, or maybe they don't look forward, to a meager and measly pension when they retire. My brother, a three-star general, 27 years service, his pension, his complete pension, is the equivalent of 280 US dollars a month. 280 US dollars a month. That's what a three-star general, a high-ranking civil servant, what most judges, prosecutors, and police generals have to look forward to. 280 dollars a month. My brother is lucky to have a prosperous brother who can keep him in style. Not all Indonesian government officials have benefactors or siblings like me, to be frank. Um, so my brother proposes with, a, with the 90 to 100 billion dollars of incremental tax revenue that the World Bank tells me is eminently feasible, technically feasible. All that requires is political will. And I quote Rodrigo Chavez, and Ambassador Blake, you're welcome to call him to check on me. I've met him five times. He tells me, he's told me that it's technically feasible to get another nine to 10% of tax ratio. That's 90 to $100 billion a year of tax ratio. According to Sri Mulyani, our finance minister, the budget deficit of last year was $25 billion. $25 billion. Sorry. Uh, yeah, $25 billion. Well, with an added 90 to $100 billion, Ambassador Blake will have a budget surplus of $75 billion. Now, apparently, Australia's tax ratio is 30%. I don't think we you know we have these grandiose ideas of reaching Australia's high tax ratio, but we can at least reach Thailand, and we can aim for India. So that in the time allotted, David, I think that's all. Yeah. Well, we want to add salaries. We want to quadruple and quintuple salaries for judges. There are eight thousand judges. We made a calculation, Prabhu and I. We actually made a calculation. Eight thousand judges. If we were to pay each judge. 200 million rupees a month, which is $14,000 a month. That would be an incentive to remain honest and stiffer penalties for corrupt officials would be a disincentive. So we would uh, close down the luxury prison called Suka Miskin in Bandung. I think, Adam, you know about this. It's a luxury prison, about a, about a five-star prison where most wealthy corruptors are housed, we would close it down and we would move 
the prison to some isolated desert island somewhere surrounded by sharks and crocodiles. <laughs> and we would remove cell phones and the hair salons that uh, have been installed in Sukhameskin for the women corruptors. That's it, Thank David. So now we have about uh, 20 minutes, give or take, for questions and answers. Who would like to begin? The gentleman right there with the hand up. Yeah, no, a microphone will be brought to you. Mike, Mike Billington. Thank you, Mike Billington with the Executive Intelligence Review. You Thank you very much, sir. I wonder if you could comment on uh, your party as well as perhaps also on your opposition's party view of Indonesia's role in the Belt and Road uh, with China and with the other countries along the Belt and Road and the important role that Indonesia plays as a hub in the Maritime Silk Road. Yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, I, I asked Secretary Pompeo this morning about his view of Chinese expansionism in the South China Sea. I think the problem is, sir, uh, I think two problems. One is that uh, Chinese, the Chinese government extends attractive loans to recipients in these so-called you know, One Belt, One Road uh, area, which extends, by the way, to Eastern Europe and to uh, Eastern Africa. Uh, they, they include, I was part of a conference sponsored by the Chinese Communist Party. I represented my brother at, the par at this conference in October of 2015. And so they view the One Belt, One Road extending all the way to Eastern Europe, all the way to Piraeus port in Greece. The president of Cyprus was there. The problem is that they extend these loans which many of these recipient countries cannot pay back. And, and uh, many of these recipient countries are eager to develop they borrow and then they find out. It's like the subprime crisis. People in the States borrowed and then found out after two or three years you had to have an adjustable rate mortgage, right? An ARM. So one of the problems is that many of these countries, they, they find themselves in the same subprime trap. They now have to pay the ARM. And uh, I think you know that Sri Lanka had to give away the port. The Chinese have taken a long-term lease, I believe it's a 99-year lease. So the problem is that, one is the, the financial sustainability of the, many of these projects. The second is um, the link that uh, many see, and I, I, it's obvious that Secretary, Secretary Pompeo saw this this morning, is the link between these projects and the military capabilities of the People's Liberation Army. So uh, he told me this morning that, uh, according to the U.S. government, the Chinese are building 14 naval bases, 14 naval bases in the perimeter of the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea. They've gone all the way to Djibouti and the Western Pacific. And they're building a base, naval base. They want to na build a naval base in Sihanoukville in Cambodia. Um, so that, that is a problem, geopolitical uh, implications and uh, the sustainability, the financial sustainability of these projects. The third aspect is more a sociological one. The Chinese government insists on all workers, I'm talking about all workers, skilled and unskilled for these projects have to be Chinese. So many of these countries have no problems with skilled workers, you know, type pipe fitters, welders, electricians, but they do have a problem and Indonesia has a problem, Indonesians, Apparently, the Indonesian government doesn't have a problem, but Indonesians have a problem. When we talk about cooks, we talk about laundrymen, we talk about cleaners, we talk about uh, lorry, uh, truck drivers, we, are, we have a major problem, and this problem is mirrored in many other recipient countries. I'm sorry, it's a long, it's a long uh, answer to a complex question. Next question, please. Lady with her hand up. Uh, my name is Patsy Widakuswara. I cover the White House for VOA. And one of the issues that I'm always looking into is how might the governing and campaign style of Donald Trump might impact leaders in other countries. So I thought this would be a good opportunity um, to ask you in front of this audience. I know this may be somewhat of a sensitive subject for pa Prabowo in regards to his campaign slogan, Make Indonesia Great Again. So I would like your enlightenment on that, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'd like to pass on this question. <laughs> I, I understand there's some American government officials here in this, uh, in this audience. Uh, frankly, I can talk to you 
privately, uh, not in this, All not right. an open session. Thank All you. All right. A lady in the back, way back. Uh, thank you. Cinnamon Dornsife, Johns Hopkins, Sice. Louder, please. Yeah. Cinnamon Dornsife, Johns Hopkins, yes. Sice. Oh, yes. And an economic question. So you talked about one of the problems being social and economic inequality. And I wonder what is your campaign and your brother's position on conditional cash transfers and a concept that some other governments have been experimenting with and thinking about um, a basic income. So conditional cash transfers or a basic income? Conditional cash transfers, you know, there's a direct correlation between election cycles and cash handouts. Uh, it happened under the SBY government twice. It's happening under the Jokowi government. Cash handouts related to elections. So every time there's an election coming up, miraculously, six months to nine months before the election, cash handouts are given. And that's a fact. No. <laughs> We don't believe in cash handouts. We don't think it's very educational. It doesn't teach people. It basically instills uh, a beggar mentality among the population. What my brother and I and our team feels that we, we need to give the, 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 the fishermen, not the fish, we need to give the fishermen the, 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 the fish hook. You know, that's an Indonesian uh, um, proverb. We have to give the fish hook. We have to give the means to the fishermen to fish, not to give them the fish because it won't be uh, educational. Now, what we b uh, believe is that we, should, we ought to empower uh, credit institutions controlled by the Indonesian state, primarily the state banks, to do more for the, the less, uh, less advantaged uh, population. We need to empower, we need to reorient the, um, the, the mission statement of the, the state banks. Uh, there's a bank, a very big bank, it's called Bank Rakyat Indonesia. Many of you Indonesian uh, experts know about it. They changed the mission statement of BRI, which was primarily a rural credit bank meant to give credit to, to poor uh, uh, farmers and to poor fishermen. They have changed it in such a way that the, this Bank Rakyat Indonesia now is a primary source of funding for building malls for the middle class. And that's a fact. So what Prabowo is going to do is we're going to call in uh, the Minister of Finance and the Minister of State Enterprises and we will compel the state banks to reorient their credits and their, uh, their, their loans to the less advantageous. So the private businessmen can buy, borrow from private banks and some of the other state banks, the Bank Rakyat and some of the other big state banks will be reoriented to, um, to, to help. The, the less privileged uh, members of the population. Yes, sir. I can't see your face, but yes, sir. Adam. Adam. Yes, Adam. Uh, Adam Shores, uh, Asia Group Advisors. Pashim, thank you very much for your uh, thorough um, uh, explanation of the Prabowo Sandy uh, campaign platform. Um, just before my question, I would like to clarify, I have not had any personal uh, experience with the minimum security prison in, uh, in Bandung. <laughs> uh, I have, my question on a serious note is, uh, is about the role of Islam uh, in Indonesian politics. There was a, a good deal of um, uh, coverage, global coverage, as well as Indonesia in 2017 on the election of the Jakarta governor, Christian, as you know. Uh, and the role of some of the political parties behind the, 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 the blasphemy trial uh, for him, and as you know, he eventually lost. Um, so just a broad question, what, you know, how do you see the role of Islam in Indonesian politics today? Um, is that experience with um, former Governor Ahok uh, indicative of, of any change in Indonesia's multi-religious traditions or its Pancasila ideology? Thank you. Right, uh, Adam, I don't know whether you know this, but the one who brought Ahok to Jakarta was my brother Prabowo. You know, you, you know that. So Ahok was my brother's candidate. In fact, I was vehemently against Ahok as a candidate, uh, and he, you know I'm Christian. You know, I'm a devout Christian. I'm not an ID card Christian. I go to church. Uh, I didn't go yesterday. I was, I was traveling yesterday. Uh, oh, sorry, on, on Sunday. No, Ahok, um, now it's, it's a good question because uh, the one who put Ahok in prison uh, is Jokowi's vice presidential candidate. You know, I don't know whether you know that, but uh, Kiai Mar Maruf Amin, who is the vice presidential ca candidate, uh, was the one who declared the fatwa. 
he put out a religious edict as chairman of the Council of Ulamas, of, uh, of clerics, and he declared, he signed the document, he declared Ahok a blasphemer. And then uh, Ahok was put on trial, and the star witness for the prosecution was Kiar Maruf Amin, who is now the vice presidential candidate for uh, Joko Widodo. So I think next week, when the Lutfi comes into town, I think it would be incumbent upon you to ask him that same question, and to, what, uh, to ask uh, uh, Jokowi and Maruf Amin what their secular or secularist credentials are. Now, in answer to your question, uh, yes, a, a, a radical Islam, or let's say a political Islam, is growing. Uh, there's a danger it can be brought to more extreme views. In fact, some of the, of the, of the Islamic uh, Islamists have extreme views. Some of them are open admirers of, uh, of Daesh, the, the Arabic equivalent of ISIL, ISIS. Uh, some of the Taliban. I think we have to be very careful. And frankly, I, as a Christian, my sister is Roman Catholic, my brother-in-law, half my family are Protestants and Catholics. My father's two aunts were Roman Catholic. Uh, it's, I think the one who can control the situation is somebody like Prabowo. I sincerely believe that. Uh, a, a person who served in the Indonesian army for 27 years, had, he was one of the founders of the anti-terror unit, anti-terrorist unit of the Indonesian Army, uh, Detachment 81, he was one of the founders. He's eminently qualified to be able to keep things under control. Now, his position is, it's better to engage in dialogue and persuade them rather than having a, a violent and combative stance. Better to engage the Hizbut Tahrir, which was an organization now banned by the Indonesian government, two million members. The history party has two million members. Now you can, you can ask where they went when their organization, they're still around. It's in my view, I believe my brother, I, I, as, a, as someone who's very concerned about this, it's better to engage and persuade and dissuade these elements rather than be openly Confrontational. I think confrontation is the last resort. Uh, Prabowo is willing to make that last resort if he has to, but he would rather engage and persuade rather than uh, use a hammer and, 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 and a sledgehammer uh, before any negotiations and dialogue. Dialogue's always the best. He's always told me for many, many years. I have one myself that um Surprisingly, has not been asked, uh, particularly since we we're in Washington. Can you tell us a little bit about your parties and your coalition's attitude toward relations with the United States? Yes. Um, in fact, by the way, that was that question was asked by your ambassador uh, Donovan to my brother uh, in December, two months ago. Uh, your ambassador, Ambassador Donovan, invited Prabowo to the U.S. Embassy and for an official meeting. He asked that question and Prabowo said, look, it, it would be his policy, it would be Prabowo's policy to continue with the current policy of non-alignment. We, we don't want to abandon our policy of non-alignment. We would uh, adopt a policy, ideally we would have no enemies and all friends. But we would like to have a continued engagement with the United States in the Asia Pacific, or now you call it the Indo-Pacific area. We would welcome, a President Prabowo would welcome a continued presence, if not greater presence, of the United States, militarily as well as economically. One of the things that Secretary Pompeo said this morning was the, the fact that so many Indonesians have been educated in the, United, in the United States. I was educated in the United States. My, two, my sister, my brother-in-law uh, were educated. My, my brother, Prabowo, actually uh, graduated from the American school in London. 
So when elected next, October, uh, next April and inaugurated in October, he will be the first president of Indonesia having graduated from an American high school. So that could be, I think, a positive <laughs> for the United States. Uh, and he graduated from Fort Bragg. He's a Green Beret. He got his Green Beret from Fort Bragg. He went to Fort Benning. Um, yes, he would welcome a greater presence, not only militarily, but with soft power. I mean, there's so much you can do with education. Uh, we've talked about this before, David. I strongly believe you believe in that. It would be very helpful if the United States were to give more scholarships to Indonesian students it would. Yeah. to learn, especially what my brother calls STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. His priority in education would be STEM. We will be spending tens of billions of dollars, and some of it for scholarships. It would be, be I think, very beneficial for Indonesia, and I think for the United States, to promote the soft power through education. Thank you. Well, we have time for a couple more, just a couple. Thank you. Anne-Marie Padgett with Caterpillar. In terms of ease of doing business in Indonesia, it seems like over the years, Indonesia's been um, sort of reverting back to localization requirements. And I'm just wondering what Prabowo's um, take is in terms of um, business investment in Indonesia and welcoming um, new investments. Well, I can, I, here I can safely say that uh, here we agree with President Trump. We would like to maximize local manufacturing and if it means localization, yes, we would encourage localization. We will continue with that policy, and we will try to maximize it. We, we would want to uh, obviously increase our employment for local people. You know, I mean, our um, unemployment, uh, you know, please don't be fooled by the official statistics. The official statistics don't tell the whole story. Unemployment in Indonesia uh, has to include underemployment. The official statistics in Indonesia say that if you're employed for a few hours a week, you are considered employed. Yes, shocking, absolutely shocking. If you're employed for two or three or four hours a week, you are considered fully employed. We know that's not true. So we would, yes, in, uh, in, in answer to your question, we would insist on keeping with the uh, localization rules. So let us thank Pakashim for his presentation today. today.